feel so far away. The diocese sent us a special university prayer and asked us to use it sometime during the month of September, which is Suicide Prevention Month. I chose not to use it because of the recent death of Aiden McCroskey. But last Sunday, I felt led to approach Hal, his father, and Hal was okay with it. And then apart from Hal, his wife, Wendy Jo, called me to make an appointment. She didn't know that Hal and I had spoken. And she shared with me some of her experiences, and she too was okay with this. And that's why I heard these pink vestments today to honor Aiden. They were given to honor him. As Wendy Joe shared with me, I felt like I was on sacred ground. She's a person full of grief and hope. And she noted that God was present with Aiden when he was born and present with Aiden when he died. And that the topic of suicide needs to be talked about. So I am. She also noted that those of us at St. Mark's, most of us are survivors of suicide. If, if we knew Aiden, if we knew other people in the community who have been affected by that, and in Wyoming, a lot of us have been affected by that. She and I spoke of suicide as succumbing to hopelessness and despair. It's a mental illness that needs to be spoken of in the light rather than in the shadows, and, and that's why we're speaking of it today. But I also want to talk about the unfathomable grief that some of us have experienced over the loss of someone, over our loss of abilities, over a diagnosis that can change our lives forever. Some of us are left with much pain and grief, fear and anxiety, and left with questions for God. Today you're invited to come to the altar rail, the shrine altar, or for prayers at the back for anointing, for healing of mind, body, and soul. You will receive the bread, the wine, and anointing with oil if you like it. If you do not want to, I'll be anointing at the altar, just cross yourself if you prefer not to be anointed with oil. It's an ancient Christian practice. Now the church and churches have given teachings through the years on the topic of suffering, the topic of suicide. In fact, the church and churches many times thought there was no salvation when that happened. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, once again, the church has been wrong in that interpretation. In fact, churches have revised that teaching so many times the church has been wrong. Because as Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Hello, what is it about nothing we don't get? Neither death nor life nor height nor principalities nor suicide nor despair nor hopelessness nor faith nor lack of faith. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Can we get that? And if you get nothing else today, know that nothing can separate you from the love of God, even your own doubts and your own lack of faith. I love the fact, I said, Wendy Jo, you've got to come to church more often because you're the only one that would understand my allusions to movies. Because she said, she thought of Aiden's death as being beamed up to the Enterprise. The Starship Enterprise, for those of you that don't go to movies, is Star Trek, okay? but directly into the presence of God, which is what a lot of us believe, that we are being directly into the presence of God. We also know that we can be directly in the presence of God now and forever. That's what eternal life is. And especially at communion, we're in the presence of God. I sometimes feel at communion that we're gathered together with all the saints, with all the angels, with all the archangels, with all I've known in the past, the present, and all who will come in the future. It's like time disappears. I 
feel out of baptisms. You and I know about the presence of God, and we are called to be lights in the world where there is darkness. We're called to proclaim hope in the midst of despair, and we're called to hold up those who cannot stand. We're called to speak love to hate. And we are called to let God work in us. That's the toughest part for me, because I want to do God's work. Wendy Jo told me about something she remembered that Shirley Hunter had said, and some of you may know this. Shirley would say, give it all up to God and go to lunch. <laughs> Love that. Give it all up to God and go to lunch. Give it all up to God. Give your emotions, your feelings, your doubts, your questions, your anger, your frustration. Give it all to God. And let it go and go to lunch. Now that's easier said than done. And it reminds us that so many things are beyond our control and even our understanding. We're called to find ways to trust God with our hearts, souls, and minds, with our fears and anxieties, and with our past, our present, and our future. <coughs> We hear in the first reading today, in the book of Job, we hear of his impatience and frustration with God and his friends, and yet we hear of his trust in God. The church has often taught us something about Job, but what, what are the words that go with Job? Woe is me. Woe is me, that's one of them. Patience. The patience of Job. Oh my gosh, how many times have I heard, well, that person has the patience of Job. Job was not patient. Once again, we get it wrong. You've not got to come here because I'll straighten you out on all the things that people have got wrong. I'm here to help you now. Job was impatient with God. I know that I'm innocent. I know that this suffering is not my fault, but his friends were convinced they offered him the platitudes we hear so often. And it comes out of a sense of the sovereignty of God. And when we say the sovereignty of God, we imagine the control of God. And I'm going to come back to what that control really is. There is that Calvinistic teaching I better be careful in light of our church history class last week uh, with the Presbyterian saying exactly what that really meant. <laughs> Please come today at 5 o'clock and Thomas will be here to talk about how the church has gotten it right from 280 to the English Reformation and talk about the prayer book and lots of great things. Please come. It will be our last session. Job does not understand innocent suffering. And he does not buy the popular theology of the day, which the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Oh, now, Madeline, I know you, you traditionals grew up with the 28th prayer book, and you know how the funerals ended in the 1928 prayer book? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. God is in control of everything that happens, bad or good. And the whole book of Job is written to combat that theory. The book of Job is a minority report. And the beauty of Scripture is we invite the minority report. We invite the questions of the popular theology. We invite the questions of God. The psalmist rail at God. They praise God. They express every feeling there is. Our Bible has it all. Even in the day of Jesus, the theology was the same. They walked by a person born blind, and Jesus' disciples say, what did they say? Was this person born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin? Did he inherit the sin? Is he paying the consequences for the sins of his fathers and his mothers? 
And the scripture talks about the, the parents will eat sour grapes and the children's teeth will be set on edge. It is a theology of scripture. But what does Jesus respond? He was born so that the glory of God might be met. Why do you think any of us were born? We were all born so that the glory of God might be known. This long book, which is mostly a poem, pretty boring actually, but go ahead and read it at night. It'll put you to sleep. <laughs> but it's all written leading up to this encounter with God. With Job's face-to-face -face encounter with God. It's like a long joke to get to the punchline. It's not a joke, though. But there's this poetic build-up. As if we're going to get the answer. Oh my gosh, his first three friends come, and, and they sit there for three days. And by the way, sitting in silence with someone who is grieving is a good thing. Wendy Jo gave me the book uh, written by a survivor of suicide for survivors. And one of the things to keep in mind is listen. Don't ask questions if you encounter people that have had that experience directly. His three friends finally start speaking and never stop. Job doesn't buy any of it. And you think, oh, and then a young friend comes. The fourth friend, and you think, oh my gosh, we're going to get the answer. Why did the innocent suffer? Why, 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 why? He gets the same thing. And Job protests, no. I am not suffering for something I did. And then we get to that moment where Job hears God speak. And God does not give him one answer. God does not give Job an answer. He responds to Job with his own question. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I set the boundaries of the waters, the land, the, the air, the sky, the stars? Where were you when I created the Leviathan just for the fun of it, as one of the psalmists said? And then Job responds. It's not the response you would expect. But he's heard the voice of God. He feels that he's come face to face with God. For those of you who've had that experience of coming to face to face with God, it's a piece of it's a moment of peace, and trust, and emptiness of all questions. For those of you who say, "When I get to heaven, I've got a ton of questions for God," come on, raise your hand. You said it. Questions will be embracing. You may cry for a hundred years in Jesus' arms, but you will have no questions because that love will be embracing you and you will be at peace. Job says, Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see you face to face. Job does not get any answers, nor do we, as to why the innocent suffer. There's only God's face to face presence. And that was enough for Job. The book of Job reminds us that our minds hearts are too small to understand the wisdom of God, the mind of God, or the heart of God. And sometimes we must do as Shirley Hunter says, leave it all to God and have lunch. I remember coming to terms with these questions and the deep grief in the death of my infant daughter Jill. And I remember both railing at God and trusting God, because if I wasn't railing at God, I wouldn't be trusting God. Where were you when my baby daughter died? And I don't hear God's response very often. 
But this time I heard the words, I was in the incubator with Jill. It reminds me of what Wendy Jim said. God was with Abe when he was born. God was with Abe when he died. There was something in God's response to my anguish over the life and death of my daughter that revealed something about the mysterious love of God, the mysterious sovereignty of God, the mysterious power of God, because my daughter had complete power over me, <laughs> over my heart, over my soul, over my mind. I felt drawn to her like I felt drawn to no other. That's the sovereignty of God. The invitation to love. It was in her weakness and her vulnerability and her perfect hands and feet that she called my love forth. Jesus, Jesus called forth our love from the cross. Jesus, in the sovereignty of God, cried out in weakness, Father, forgive them, 